Welcome to our series on the Mythological Schools of Thought, where we bring you the history of research into the ancient sources of the Teutonic Mythos. Here we shall explore the evolution of mythic interpretation as it pertains to heathen belief, while demonstrating both the truths and the flaws within each school. We truly feel that by properly explaining the timeline of this research, we can help those of our faith to understand the necessity of moving beyond the academic lines and welcoming the true reconstruction of this belief. Our religion was subject to centuries of persecution, and as such the documents that led to its revival originally ended up in the hands of those opposed to it. Once we recognize the flaws within their methods, we can begin to discern what can be of benefit to our community and what must be discarded. We are the epic school of mythological research, built around the method originally developed by Victor Rydberg in the late 19th century. From the very beginning of our school, we have always viewed the stories as part of a religious structure. The gods are not symbols, they are not fantasies, and they are not deified humans. The Norna Society has been working diligently for the past 25 years to develop Rydberg's method into a working body of sacred lore for our folk. This is our mission. This is our passion. This is our religion. In our previous video, we discussed the Interpretatio School and its impact upon the ancient Mediterranean worldview. At the same time that these ideas were developing, Another philosopher would codify his outlook on the myths, which would influence research into the field for millennia to come. Although other writers before him would present the notion that gods are humans, the philosophy surrounding this idea would be named after the man that popularized it in the ancient world, Euhemerus. There is much that is not known of Euhemerus himself, and many of the quotes we find about his belief are from second-hand sources. Even his birthplace is obscured within the annals of history, with the most likely place being Messina in Sicily around the late 4th century BC. We do know that what Euhemerus believed was an early form of atheism, wherein he rejected the gods as ancient kings and heroes that had achieved divine status. Writing of him a century later in his Bibliotheca Historica, Diodorus described a fictional narrative that Euhemerus had created, which also contained some descriptive elements of the interpretatio method. Euhemerus goes on to say that Uranus was the first to be king, that he was an honorable man and beneficent, who was versed in the movement of the stars, and that he was also the first to honor the gods of the heavens with sacrifices, whence he was called Uranus, or heaven. There were born to him by his wife Hestia two sons, Titan and Cronus, and two daughters, Rhea and Demeter. Cronus became king after Uranus, and marrying Rhea he begat Zeus and Hera and Poseidon. And Zeus, on succeeding to the kingship, married Hera and Demeter and Themis, and by them he had children, the Curates by the first name, Persephone by the second, and Athena by the third. And going to Babylon he was entertained by Belus, and after that he went to the island of Panchea, which lies in the ocean, and here he set up an altar to Uranus, the founder of his family. From there he passed through Syria and came to Cassius, who was ruler of Syria at that time, and who gave his name to Mount Cassius. And coming to Cilicia, he conquered in battle Silix, the governor of the region, and he visited very many other nations, all of which paid honor to him and publicly proclaimed him a god. This notion of kings becoming gods, in connection with the Interpretatio Romana, would be seen as a principle of demonstrating to the world that the gods of the Mediterranean were the rightful heirs to the world and the founders of all religion and culture, no matter how false. Compare the above statement regarding Uranus as the first to honor the gods of the heavens with sacrifices to another quote of Diodorus where he stated, Their first king was Uranus, and he gathered the human beings who dwelt in scattered habitations within the shelter of a walled city and caused his subjects to cease from their lawless ways and their bestial manner of living. The idea that Rome would become the center of all culture and religion is a very important concept as our investigation continues. 
for this will permeate European culture for centuries to come and influence the belief of later scholars and institutions. From its onset, we can see that both the interpretatio and the euhemerist schools often overlap as their goals were often the same, to glorify the empire and denounce the sovereignty of foreign or barbaric nations. We first see the use of euhemerism as a method of Christian propaganda by Clement of Alexandria in the second century AD. Clement studied the Greek philosophers vehemently and cited Euhemerus as one of his inspirations in combating pagan belief. Clement recognized the gods as humans, but it was not until Tertullian that this would become a complete doctrine for the Christian apologist movement. Writing shortly after Clement, his offering to the Euhemerus school would greatly influence the apologists that sought to discredit paganism and make way for the coming of the new faith. And since, as you dare not deny these to have been men, so you have determined to affirm that they became gods after their death, let us treat of the causes which have worked out this effect. In the first place, indeed, you must needs allow that there is some superior god, and some dispenser of deity, who has made gods out of men. For neither could they have assumed to themselves that deity which they had not, nor could any give it to them which had it not, save one who in his own proper right possessed it. Tertullian's entire supposition is based upon the premise that the gods must have been deified humans, and this sentiment would echo throughout the Christian world for centuries to come. Understand that these writings are not mere scribblings of monastic thinkers isolated from the world around them, but rather would serve as the justification for the brutal wars and attacks upon indigenous peoples that would later take place. One noted Christian Euhemerist was Lactantius, who was the mentor of Constantine, the emperor that converted Rome. When Constantine established the state religion of the empire, he immediately began persecuting pagans and burning down their temples, all with Lactantius at his advisory. Without doubt, all those who are worshipped as gods were men, and were also the earliest and greatest kings. But who is ignorant that they were invested with divine honors after death, either on account of the virtue by which they had profited the race of men, or that they obtained immortal memory on account of the benefits and inventions by which they had adorned human life, and not only men, but women also. The idea that the gods were human became a staple of the Latin worldview, which would spread throughout Europe along with Christianity. We will see that this would also blend with the interpretatio method by using Roman heroes as the basis for other gods and solidifying the euhemerist approach for the benefit of the empire. It was an effective way to both denounce the old ways and herald in the era of their new god and new morality. It then coincided with passages from the Bible that declared the old ways false and evil, such as in Romans 1 21 through 23, where it states, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. As Christianity made its way across Europe, the ideals of the empire spread with it and established a mindset that would uplift Rome and its culture while casting aside the ways of their forebears. People were conditioned to believe that Latin was the language of the educated and that Roman history and Roman ways were preferable to the native customs of the people introduced to this new belief. Latin phrases became the mottos of families and clans and would later become those of nations throughout Western civilization. This all began with the acceptance of the schools and monastic orders that would establish church rule above all, and with church authority came Roman custom, always. The first developments of Teutonic Euhemerism began when the Franks created the idea that their people were descended from the heroes of Troy. These heroes were the ones who built the empire and solidified it shortly after the Trojan War. To connect one to the Trojans and their lineage was to connect one to Rome, and as we have seen, this had become of the utmost importance. 
Connection to Rome not only represented a cultural replacement, it also meant ties to the wealthiest and most industrial nation on the planet. Our first glimpse of this came from the Chronicle of Fredegar. Citing Hieronymus and Virgil as his sources, Fredegar makes the argument that the Trojans settled on the Rhine shortly after they had traveled about Asia. This would be a pivotal statement as it would be repeated by Christian Euhemerus for centuries. The blessed Hieronymus wrote about the kings of the Franks who once lived, a thing which the work of the poet Virgil told earlier, that they had Priam for king first, when Troy was taken by Ulysses' trick, they had then departed. Later they had Frigga as king. There was a twofold division. A part of them had gone to Macedonia, others called Phrygians after Frigga after wandering through Asia, had settled on the shore of the river Danube and the sea. Then there was a second division, a half-part, with Francio as their king, set out again and went to Europe. Invading Europe with their wives and children, they settled on the bank of the Rhine. Not far from the Rhine, they tried to found a city likewise named Troy. It remained a task undertaken but not completed. This newly developed Teutonic Euhemerism would gain popularity throughout the Frankish realm and would be mimicked by writers in other northern lands as well. This theme would spread throughout the Teutonic world as the basis for all of Western civilization and would be represented in various forms by Jordanes for the Goths, Saxo Grammaticus for the Danes, Paulus Diaconus for the Langobards, Viticand of Corvey for the Saxons, and so on. The most noted for our purposes here is the Euhemerous method of the Icelanders, that of Snorri Sturluson which was nothing more than a continuation of the material written by his predecessors. There is a misconception surrounding Snorri's work that his was some sort of anomaly, an isolated work of mythology presented in a way that was intentionally meant to preserve the ancient lore. If that were the case, we would have to look at all of the other Euhemerized sources in the same manner, when in fact we have proven that this was a propaganda method utilized by the church in order to convince people of the might of Rome and the sanctity of the new religion. Snorri's work does have one advantage in that he cites his sources, whereas previous authors wrote their histories as if they were presenting the information anew. The primary source that Snorri cites is the collection of poems we have called the Poetic Edda, in contrast to his Prose Edda. This is a euhemerist account that mimics exactly what was presented in the Fredegar Chronicle and many others after it. Friedlif had a son whose name was Vodin, whom we call Odin. He was an outstanding person for wisdom and all kinds of accomplishments. His wife was called Frigida, whom we call Frigg. Odin had the gift of prophecy and so did his wife. And from this science he discovered that his name would be remembered in the northern part of the world and honored above all kings. For this reason he became eager to set off from Turkey, or Troy, and took with him a very great following, young people and old, men and women, and they took with them many precious things, and whatever countries they passed through, great glory was spoken of them, so that they seemed more like gods than men. The Gulfagining, which is Snorri's most celebrated work, is rife with errors and misunderstandings of the source poetry, and is meant to further the Euhemerist element by placing the gods in the role of deceivers. The very title means the deluding of Gilfi and here the Aesir place illusions and spells before Gilfi to convince him of their might and to fool him into believing that they are divine. It is a method to fully demonstrate the devaluing of the ancient ways by explaining exactly how these human beings could have tricked others into worshipping them. The entire text is written in the Latin tradition of the dialogue and not in the context of any native storytelling structure. Next, Gangleri, Gilfi in disguise, heard great noises in every direction from him, and he looked out to one side, and when he looked around further, he found he was standing out on open ground, could see no hall and no castle. Then he went off on his way and came back to his kingdom and told of the events he had seen and heard about, and from this account these stories passed from one person to another. But the Aesir sat down to discuss and hold a conference and went over all these stories that had been told him and assigned those same names that were mentioned above to the people and places that were there in Sweden. So that when long periods of time had passed, men should not doubt that they were all the same. Those Aesir about whom stories were told above and those who were not given the same names. 
So someone was there given the name Thor, and this means the ancient Thor of the Aesir, that is Oku Thor, and to him are attributed the exploits which Thor or Hector performed in Troy. And it is believed that the Turks told tales about Ulysses and that they gave him the name Loki, for the Turks were especially hostile to him. So we can see that in the Euhemerist movement, we also witness a continuation of the interpretatio method as it relates to the glorification of the empire and the devaluing of the native divinities and beliefs. It is meant to make the new religion seem like the only reasonable path one should follow and maintains the recognition of the Roman occupation throughout its history. As stated, this recognition would later manifest itself with Latin mottos and phrases that would permeate Western civilization as the language of the learned. Thus, Latin language and culture would supplant the native heritage, which would be viewed as crude and barbaric. Interestingly enough, the very word barbaric is from the Latin meaning foreign or not Roman. In each of these videos, we are going to demonstrate the three qualities of the schools represented. These will be their purpose. What was the school designed for and who was behind this design? This will help us to understand the motives and biases that exist within that particular school of thought. Their litmus test. What is the basis for their conclusions? Each school has a litmus test that it must follow in order to meet their purpose. Their results. What has been the result of their conclusions? How have their conclusions influenced the study of Teutonic mythology? Here are the three qualities of the Euhemerus school. Its purpose. To denigrate the old gods as human beings who tricked the people into worshipping them. This set the stage for Christianity to act as the only true religion and present the idea that all other religions are false. This began with an atheist viewpoint set forth by Euhemerus, who was appreciated by Christians for his critiques of paganism. It's litmus. The gods must be humans that were raised to divine status in order to validate the new religion or other ideals that would seek to supplant the old ways. Thus history and myth must be blended into one in order to fit this model. Its results. This school became the catalyst for the Christian expansion of Europe, as well as a justification for the brutal slaughters of indigenous people all over the world. In conjunction with the Interpretatio school, it also furthered the idea that all of civilization was developed from Rome, and thus the empire deserved homage and servitude. This would continue to present itself in the modern age when Latin culture and phrases were upheld as the language of the learned. By further understanding the qualities of these schools, we will continue to unravel the many layers of confusion that have developed over the years within the study of the ancient sources of our people. The idea is to get you to question and seek the answers yourself, rather than tell people how to believe. We feel that as we move forward in this series, the viewer will take notice of the methods handed down and start to critically review the ideas that many feel are set in stone. For more information on the Norna Society, visit our website, www.norna.org, or follow us on Facebook, VK, or MeWe. If you are interested in joining us, you can email us at nornasociety at gmail.com for a free PDF of our membership guide. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and keep up with the latest discoveries and discussions.